to We Shall Overcome, episode something like seven, I think. Um, tonight's program is uh, generously supported by two very special governing members of the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra who um, do so much to keep the orchestra going and to um, show support to the musicians. So thank you so much to them. Um, my topic tonight is the War of the Romantics. And tonight will be a little bit more talking uh, as opposed to last week, which was more playing. So I hope that you'll enjoy that format. The War of the Romantics is a schism that developed in the latter half of the 1800s among the Romantic composers in Germany. And it happened because of a huge event that left a giant vacuum. And that was the death of Robert Schumann. I'm just gonna move closer to this mic. I have a mic over here that is well placed for piano, um, but I know that my voice sometimes doesn't carry. So, um, Robert Schumann died in 1856, and in that vacuum that followed, there developed two different camps of um, composers who felt that music should go in one of two directions, and those two directions were quite different. So both of the groups were absolute devoted uh, disciples of Beethoven. They were both motivated by that incredible adulation and admiration for Beethoven, who had been dead for decades already. Um, the first camp that we're going to explore tonight is the conservative camp. And this camp consisted of Schumann when he was alive, uh, his wife, Clara Wieck, wonderful pianist, composer herself, uh, Johannes Brahms, who was their dear friend. And side note, next week's We Shall Overcome is going to focus on Robert and Clara and Johannes, and that amazing friendship with so much cross-pollination of musical ideas and, um, and friendship and love. Uh, so that's the basic cast of characters. There was another person who was heavily involved, and that was Joachim. Josef Joachim was a, a violinist celebrated all over Europe. And so these four people, um, we could describe their position as conservative they thought of themselves as conservatives because they thought that Beethoven had achieved eternal greatness and that everything that he accomplished should be preserved. So there were two ways that they thought that that was to be accomplished. One was that music should be absolute music, music for music's sake, music not to tell a story, music not to illustrate uh, an image, music just for the pure, um, the pure sound, and very importantly, the form. So another thing that they wanted, the second component of their school of thought was that old genres should be preserved. So they wanted to pour their romantic surging idealism and utopianism and suffering. They wanted to pour that into old vessels like sonata form and song form and rondo form and symphonic form. They thought those giant, you know, architectural manifestations were really important to preserve. So it sounds a lot like the conservative tradition now, wanting to preserve what has gone before that is so lauded. Uh, the, the romantics in this camp had a really good platform for getting their ideas out because Robert Schumann was probably the most celebrated composer in Europe at the time. Clara Schumann was one of the most celebrated concert pianists at a time when that wasn't really a thing yet. Uh, and as a woman, boy, she, is a, a, she was a force of nature and if I could go back in time to meet one person, it might be her. My piano is actually named after her because it has a big Brahms sound. Um, so they had the composing 
They had the performing, and also Robert was a writer. He was the editor of a journal called the Neue Zeitschrift für Musik, the new journal for music. And that was where he wrote lengthy articles about these ideas that he and his compatriots had. So we're going to hear from Brahms first. I'm going to play two rhapsodies from Opus 79. They are very much romantic in their character, but very conservative in the fact that they revere these old forms. So the first one in B minor is kind of an extended song form, which is ABA. And then at the end, there's a coda. But the A section itself has a lot of element of sonata form in it as well. So that's a little bit more of a complex structure. And the second rhapsody is pretty much straight ahead sonata form with two themes that um, battle one another that are presented, they battle and then they're presented again and they resolve. So here are Brahms Rhapsodies, Opus 79, numbers one and two. Thank you. 
So you can see the, the romanticism very evident, um, but also hopefully you can hear that reverence for the past that uh, these conservatives were, uh, were holding on to. So let's visit the other camp now. Um, these guys were the progressives. These guys thought, yes, Beethoven was a hero. Yes, we absolutely can't imagine what could possibly come next, but we must. They called themselves the New German School, and uh, they thought of themselves as progressive, and they wrote music they called the art of the future, the music of the future. So clearly very different um, mindset, taking the same event, uh, Beethoven's work, and uh, having a completely opposite response to it. So um, the two main components of this camp were Franz Liszt in Paris and Richard Wagner, who was in uh, Dresden, but also spent time in Venice. So these guys, as opposed to music for music's sake, absolute music, these guys wanted to go in the direction of program music, which is music that does tell a story, music that does illustrate an image or bring to mind something extra musical. Um, and they actually took that even farther. You may know that Wagner took this really to the incredible extreme. His operatic experiments in Bayreuth became the artist, um, all of the artwork swirling together, the costumes, the scenery, the libretto, the music, the orchestra, the singers, the stage, um, all of it swirling together into that Gesamtwerk idea, the, the total artwork. And that's where, um, that's where the end of this was, really, the end of this movement, that all of these arts were cross-pollinating each other. Um, so program music was part of their mantra. And the other thing is that they weren't interested in salvaging and preserving those old forms. They didn't want to go to a museum. They wanted to write new pieces. And music that tells a story doesn't lend itself very well to sonata form. Sonata form is too, is too strict. And so they blew up all the boundaries and started writing things that had no form at all, things that were through composed. The piece I'm gonna play for you next, which is an illustration of this camp, uh, it's a piece by Liszt. It's called the Lugubre Gondola, which means the, the funeral gondola or the sad gondola. Gondola is the boat that's used in Venice to ferry people around. And um, it is through composed. It doesn't have a set structure. I mean, it does have sections. Uh, it's not random, but the sections aren't ordered in any particular way that follows a, um, a pattern or a path. Uh, it's a little bit more stream of consciousness. And there's an interesting uh, history behind this piece, which is that um, Liszt wrote it when he was visiting Wagner in Venice in late 1882. And while he was there, he had a premonition of Wagner's death. And he, I think it was a dream. He dreamed that Wagner died and he saw the funeral gondas, which are all shrouded in black ferrying through the canals of Venice. And he woke up and wrote down this piece. Uh, it's very intense, uh, passionate and grief stricken. And uh, it's actually almost hallucinatory. It's very much a late work of Liszt. This is not one of his show pieces. This was one that tells a story, conjures an image. So it's very much an example of program music and this new form that was much, much freer. So hopefully you'll really hear a, an enormous difference between the work of these two men. Um, this might be a little bit morbid, but I think there are a lot of people in the world right now who have lost loved ones and have not been able to um, gather with family and friends to say goodbye. And that's such an important part of grieving. So I'd like to dedicate this performance right now to those people who have lost um, loved ones and friends and family in this crisis and um, this is for them.
Although you could describe the divide between the camps as bitter, there was actually also a lot of admiration from one side to the other. For example, Brahms wouldn't admit it in public, but he did tell his friends that he loved Wagner's music. He didn't necessarily like some of Wagner's ideas. Wagner was an anti-Semite. Um, he didn't like some of the direction that Wagner wanted to go. He didn't like the abandonment of the old forms and the absolute music, but um, he did call himself a true Wagnerian. <laughs> and um, Liszt actually was so admiring of Robert Schumann that he transcribed one of his songs, which is my final selection tonight. This is a song called Widmung, which means dedication, and it was written by Robert to his bride, Clara, after a years long period in which they were kept apart from one another and prevented from marrying by Clara's piano teacher and autocratic father, whose name was Friedrich Wieck, and he utterly opposed the marriage and um, went to court to stop them from marrying. And uh, actually, no, he didn't do that. He, he forbade them from marrying and Robert and Clara went to court and sued for the right to marry which they won, and in 1840, they did marry. And this song uh, is such an exuberant, ecstatic expression of love from Robert to his bride. And Liszt transcribed it, and he, he didn't Listify it too much, he just enough, maintained all of the integrity of the first work, um, but brought his own signature flair. So Widmung, uh, the poetry is by Friedrich Rückert, and it's beautiful. Maybe I'll post it as a comment after I go off the air. Uh, and uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy this. This is a beautiful song, usually sung by a soprano and done with piano. It's part of a cycle called Myrton.
back next week and hear about uh, my favorite musical couple, Robert and Clara, and um, their dear friend Brahms. And if you're looking for some reading material, this book is wonderful. It's called Longing. It's by J.D. Landis, and it's a historical fictional novel about Robert and Clara and how they met. And much of it is imagined, but it is based on um, based on real events. So, good night. <laughs>